Praise the Lord. Uh, thanks for being here this morning. You could have been on vacation, right? You could be anywhere else this morning, but you chose to be uh, where God's people are. Amen? Uh, I want to um, turn to Ephesians 5. I'll read a couple scriptures this morning, and then I want to give you some facts or some truths uh, this morning <clears throat> as I share with you and as they put up there the title's context. So if you're taking notes, and I encourage you to take notes um, for two reasons. One is when you write things down, you remember it. And two, I'll forget where I'm at, and it helps me to remember where I'm at in the course of my sermon. Is that okay? Okay, so write this down. So Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to read verses uh, 16 and 17. It says, i got to put my important, important things on this morning. Here we go, ready? There we go. Uh, it's, it's sad when you've got a large print and you still need glasses. Amen? Can I get a, can I get a witness? Be, be very careful then, verse 15 and 16, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. And I'd like that, if we could read that to say, be very careful then the context with which you live. Let's pray. Lord, thank you this morning for a great opportunity to share your word. And I pray this morning, Lord, that, that what comes out of my mouth will be your words and not mine. That your, your opinions, how you think and not how I think. So Lord, bless us this morning. Give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and feet to do what your word says do. And all God's people said... Amen. I want to give you some facts or some truths this morning. Okay, here we go. Ready? I didn't have enough time this week. Here's another, another uh, uh, this is actually a statistic, 9 and 433. Here's another one. Um, I'm going to sing a song. Is that okay? Don't need the musicians. I'm going to do Acapulco. That's my Andy Griffith reference for the day. Okay? Uh, Acapulco. Here we go. You ready? Ready? Here it goes. <coughs> Everybody likes Bronco busting and the California Spurs. Everybody likes to watch the big show now and the Cowboys wearing bat wing show chaps. Thanks. Really? That's all I get? Thank you. Thank, no, no, stop. No, no, keep going, stop. Okay. 25% social media. And the last one's 412. And so those are statistics I wanted to share with you this morning. Each of those things I've shared, they're factual, they're truths, they're statistics. And you're looking at me funny, and I don't know why. Why are you looking at me funny? Because the things I've shared with you are actual things. I mean, I sang a song, right? I know it wasn't very good, but uh, I mean, the song wasn't good. My singing was, but the song wasn't. Uh, so so what, is, what is wrong with the things that I just shared? There are six things I, that I share with you, so what's wrong with them? Because you understand the context behind them. And believe it or not, there is context behind it. You want me to share them with you so it will make sense? So you, Because you're going to sing that song all day now. And you're going, to be, you're going to be texting me on Facebook and me and saying, wait, what's that song again? By the way, it's copyrighted. So if you're listening on to YouTube or anything else, it's a copyright. You, my permission to use it on your, on your, on your record. The thing is, when you share facts and statistics and all those things without context, it, it, even though they're still true, they become confusing, right? Because you're looking at, why is he singing that song <laughs> this morning? But here's the thing, context. I didn't have enough time this week. How many of you thought I was going to say to prepare a sermon? <laughs> C- come on, some of you thought it too, didn't you? Okay, C- out of context. Actually, I didn't have enough time this week to exercise, uh, Monday night was the minister's uh, a meeting, and congratulations to Pastor Scott, uh, who's elected our sectional presbyter, it's okay if I say that, which was, uh, <laughs> yes, <clears throat> and so, uh, so instead of playing basketball Monday night, I was with a bunch of preachers, you know, and so I didn't have enough time this week to exercise, all right, so that's the context. Okay, 9 and 433, right? Well, here's what I found out, uh, baseball fans, Cleveland Indian baseball fans, Thank you, thank you, Indians, okay. And I know your dad, right? Okay, so um, up until Friday night in the baseball game, if you watch the Indians beat the Yankees, and I love saying that too. Um, in the Major League season this year, um, in all the games, if a team was trailing by five or more runs in the sixth inning or beyond, their record was nine wins and 433 losses. And now, thanks to the Indians, it's 10 and 433. Go tribe. Okay. So that was it. Okay. The song I sang. 
Do you want me to sing it again? No, I won't. No, it's okay. Okay. I, no. Okay. When I was about 12 years old, I wrote that song. Isn't that great? I wrote that song. Uh, my sister was sick, and back in those days, you just stayed home. With, I'd stayed home with my sister. And we spent the entire day, because she was in bed sick, with an old cassette recorder. Now you know I'm talking. Some of you are with me now, right? Where you had to push play and record at the same time. Okay? And we made up songs all day, and I made that song up. And you're thinking, why would you make that song up? Because the curtains in my room had the words Bronco Busting, California Spur. I don't know anything about rodeo. That's just my curtains. And I had those all through high school. So I made up a song, and I still to this day remember that song because of the curtains. See, now you have context. And yes, I'll sing it for you again later if you want. 25% is this. It could be anything. 25% of Christians never read their Bible. That goes along with the sermon today. 25, think about that. 25% of Christians never read their Bible. All right? And, and social media. And here's the context for that. You really need to go back and listen to the What is Right sermon series Pastor Scott shared on social media. It was tremendous. And so, is it okay if I say it? Go and do that again. He didn't ask me to do that. I'm not getting paid for that advertisement or anything. And the last one, 412, is this. Hebrews 412. And I think they'll have it up there. Hebrews 412 is a scripture that is powerful. And when we talk about context, we talk about uh, all these things, all these statistics that, that, made, that didn't make sense without context. Now when I give you the context, even though the song is silly, it, you have a context to it. Oh, he made it up when he's 12. Now it makes sense because he's making it up when he's 52. We've got problems, right? Unless you're a rodeo person. If you are, I apologize. Okay? But here we go. Uh, Hebrews 4.12. I'm reading out of the NIV. says, For the word of God is alive and active. Sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates marrow, it judges the thoughts and intentions and the attitudes of the heart. See, when things are shared in context, they make sense. They may not be believed, but they make sense. Now when I say 940, 433, it makes sense. Even if you don't like baseball, at least it makes sense, right? So when we, when we share things in context, <clears throat> when we read this scripture about for the word of God... What is it about our lives that gives us context? For, for those of us as believers, it's God's Word. Why? Because God's Word is alive. It, it's not the Bhagavad Gita. Okay? It's not what the Hindus believe. It's just a book. God's Word is not a book. It's alive. It's active. It's breathing. It cuts us. You know what a double-edged sword is? We're used to the pirate swords, you know, that, that have one side is really sharp or a knife you cut your tomatoes with. I don't like tomatoes, but use them to cut your knife. And you try to keep your finger away from the knife, right? A double-edged sword is on both sides. And usually on one side, it's jagged. So that when they cut you, it cuts going in and coming out. God's word cuts going in and coming out. It's a double-edged sword. In context, the truth makes sense. So, the question we ask ourselves then, <clears throat> as believers, is what is the context for our lives? What is the underlying foundation, the, the, the principles that give our life meaning, give our life purpose? That's the context with which we live. And how we choose to live our lives provides context for unbelievers, for those who are on the fence, for those who may, may uh, see something and may want to come to Christ or may, may want to be looking for something, but there's no context. Listen, people in the world, and, and, and I, I, you know, what word, I don't know what the, what the correct word to use now. We don't want to say sinners. We don't use lost. So, so people who don't follow Christ, they're not disciples of Christ, okay, we'll use that. Their lives have no context. They tried to have context, their jobs, some people, their jobs are the baseline for their lives. And if things are going well at their jobs, then their life has meaning. But if things aren't going well, they lose their job, then all of a sudden there, there's no meaning to anything. Some people find uh, their baseline, the context of their life, and their family. And as we have found out as we've gotten older, your kids grow up and leave. Then what? Then you pray for grandkids. Amen? Grandparents, amen? Pray for grandkids, but they don't get to stay all the time. 
So some people's lives are based on family, and, and when tragedy happens, or, or, or even good things, kids leave and go to college, and they get married, and then they move to Louisiana and Florida. Anybody with me? That, that's what mine did. <laughs> what happens to the context of your life when the family's no longer the, 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 the thing? Some people find context in, in who they are or, or, or more in, in what has happened to them in life. They become victims. Listen, there are people that are victims. I'm an example of that. But we can't live, that can't become the context of our lives. So we as Christians, how we live and how we act is a result of the context with which we live and believe. Remember, 25% of believers, these are people that go to church regular basis. 25% of them never read their Bible. So what is the context of their lives? What, it, what is it in their life that gives meaning when somebody says 412? Oh, the context is Hebrews 412. And it's God's words alive, active, quick. One of the translations says it's quick, sharper than a two-edged sword, double-edged sword. The context of our lives are determined by uh, how we view the world, or how we view the world, uh, context shapes that, okay? Uh, here's the sad thing. Most, most Christians, unfortunately, when the world holds a mirror up to us, unfortunately, what the world sees is themselves. In other words, they're holding a mirror up to us, and they see themselves. Because for the majority of Christianity in America, we're talking about American Christianity here, okay? For the majority of American Christians, there is no difference between us and those who don't follow Christ. We watch the same movies. We are, you, you, listen, there's statistics galore. We, we, go to the, we watch the same R-rated movies they do. We watch the same TV shows as non-believers. We go to the same places to eat as non-believers. We do all the statistics are the same. Divorce rate's the same, okay? The, the rate of, 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 of um, in teenage pregnancy among Christians are the same or higher, okay? So the world is looking for context. When tragedy strikes, they're looking for purpose in that. And when they hold the mirror up to see if, there's something different in us. They see themselves, which is why in America right now, the gospel is null and void. It's not because the gospel is null and void. I'll talk about that in a minute. What they should see when they hold the mirror up to us is a reflection of Jesus. Because we as Christians, the context of our lives has to be based on God's word and the power of the Holy Spirit living in us. See, I can start quoting all kinds of scriptures right now. And we'd all nod our heads and say, hey, man, preach it, preach it, brother. And we might even start shouting. My mom used to shout, man. My mom would shout. She'd be like. And then sometimes she'd do it this way. And then when I wasn't paying attention, in the middle of her shouting, she'd smack and go right back to shouting. Because the spirit knows no. It was usually me getting smacked, too. And usually I deserved it too, so I thank you, Mom, for keeping me on the straight and narrow. <laughs> so, so, now see, you're taking notes, because where was I? See, so you didn't take anything. So what happens is we have this, I can quote scripture after scripture, and I can sit there and say, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in us. Can I get an amen? But do we live that way? Think about this, think about this. Jesus who was fully God and fully man, hung on a cross. Where's the cross? we got one in the sanctuary. H hung on the cross. Churches don't have crosses anymore. Hung on the cross. Can you put a cross up there for me? <laughs> hung on a cross for our sins and died. He was dead. There was no coming back when you die, right? Boom, gone. But on Sunday morning, the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. Come on, people. That spirit dwells in you and me. I mean, come on, that's crazy. 
me, and, and listen, I know how I am, to know that the Holy Spirit still resides in me, that's powerful. I mean, there's all kinds of scriptures we can quote that we believe, but do they give context and meaning to our lives? In other words, we can believe that scripture, but does the world know that we believe that scripture because the context of our lives says that spirit lives in me because I'm different. When you hold the mirror to me, you're going to see Jesus. You might see an imperfect me, but a perfect Christ living in me. That's the context. That's how our lives are changed. That's what we see in the world. <clears throat> when you hold that mirror up. American Christianity is shrinking, not because God's word has changed or because it's invalid, it's because we don't know it, we don't live by it, and we don't have our worldview shaped by it. We're memorizing scripture every week. Your word have I hid in my heart that I might not. So if you don't want to sin, what should you do? There we go. So when the world sees that is the context of how we live there in that. My son called. He, and, and he's, God's really gotten a hold of his life. And he uh, calls me, and he has a friend he, he met at work, working with, who has had a real, uh, just a bad life. You don't even, the details are terrible. 30 years old, got his first job. <clears throat> That's part of the, the, the horribleness of his life, uh, all the things that happened to him. And him and my son have been talking for a few months, and they'll talk about God. He, he, he came to know Christ, but then he's, str he's struggling in his walk. Because when you come to know Christ, you need someone to disciple you, right? If you're not sure about that, the last time I preached, you can go watch it on YouTube. There were 12 views on that. And I thought, that's great. So I found out my mom watched it 11 times. But that's another story. So, and so, yeah, so was, and, and, and I watched it. So, <laughs> anyways, my wife's like, no way. I heard it. I was there live, and that's it. So, so here's, here's the thing. So he says, he says, Dad, I, you know, I'm talking to him, and I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, encourage him and, 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 and tell him things, and he'll say, but why are you so calm when these things happen? And Caleb's like, hey, six months ago, I, you, I was the least calm person in the world. And so my son says, Dad, I, I want to try to find a book or something like that. And I, I just said to my son, I said, Caleb, I said, you are the book. Because there's no book that's going to change his life. What's going to change his life is somebody who lives in the context of God's word. That our ups and downs in lives, because we're going to have them because we're emotional, but it's going to be shaped by God's word. I'm going to be fearful, but God's word says I don't have to have fear because perfect love casts out fear. So when I'm feeling fearful, I can say, God, help me not to feel this way. Now, I'm not a prophet, nor the son of a prophet, and I've never played one on TV. But I have two observations about contextual living <clears throat> in our great country that I want to share this morning. And the first one, uh, Amos 8.11. <clears throat> and this was a prophecy given to Israel. And I, I believe this is something that's been happening in our country and is continuing to happen. And, and I find this fascinating. God says, I will send a famine through the land, not a famine of food or thirst for water, but a famine of hearing the words of the Lord. I believe what we are witnessing in our country is a famine. We're not starving. Even the poorest people in our country would be rich in the majority of the world. Even the homeless people in our country have better places to live than the majority of people in the world. Okay? The famine that's in our land is hearing God's word. And God has sent it. God has allowed us as believers to live out the context of our lives that we want to live, that we choose to live. And so what God's done is there's a famine, not hearing the word of God. And, and the, 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 the word of God that they're hearing from the TV preachers and the, and the other kinds of things is not the word of God. It's another gospel. And that's my first observation. The second one that goes along with it, and remember this, it's God sent. America's not falling apart because we're losing the culture war. America's falling apart because they're not hearing God's word and he sent it. He did it. 
And he didn't do it because he hates people. He did it because he loves people. Here's the second part of this, the observation I have. Second Chronicles 7.14, there's a revival coming in America. But it's not going to be Brownsville. It's, it's not going to be a revival where people are rushing to the church and 80,000 people getting saved at a Billy Graham crusade. I believe the revival that's going to happen in our country, which is happening around the world in other countries because of persecution, things like that. Here, here's what I believe. <clears throat> my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my faith. And, and, there's one more thing. And this is the part we like to skip over because we get to humble ourselves. Okay, I'll humble myself. I'll, 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 I'll pray and seek God's face. But the other one is turn from our wicked ways. It's time for us to stop living within the context of the world as Christians. That's carnal Christianity. And it's why, it's why there's a famine in the land. Because believers have not turned from our wicked ways. So what the world hears about God is not the word God wants them to hear. It says, then, then I will hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin. When he's talking about forgive their sin, he's not talking about unbelievers. Remember, it's the believers. The context is believers, my people. Then I'll forgive my people's sin. My people who have lived out of a context that's not from me. That's revival. The next great move of God is going to be in the marketplace, in the homes, in the schools. Because believers are going to wake up and begin to live within the context of the Bible. And like I told my son, Caleb, you're the book that he's going to read. You're, you are going to provide the context that's going to help change that man's life. And I told him, I said from, from before, I said, you've already begun the disciple-making process, Caleb. And he goes, man, Dad, I get that now, what you're talking about. I get it now. Context. So... Everything I've said today, you've probably heard before. <clears throat> okay? So, so what can we do about it? Well, the ending to this sermon is very simple, very basic. There's three things. <laughs> One is pray. I know. We all pray. But dear God, bless my food, and, and please take all the, the carbohydrates and the cholesterol and the fat out of it so that I can fit back into that shirt I wore when I was 27. And we pray. Now, here's what I want you this week. I want you to get alone with God. I want you to shut everything off. Phones, TVs, music. I love listening to praise and worship when I pray. Turn it all off. And it's going to take you 10, 15 minutes to get your brain to shut down to where it's focusing on Him and not on things. And then I want you just to listen to God. Because God wants to speak to you. And not necessarily through a preacher, although that's good. Or through somebody, a mentor, that's good. God wants to speak to you personally. So this week, take it out. Get along with God. Shut yourself away. Second thing is, another thing, is just a basic thing, it's time to start reading your Bibles. It, listen, you have an app. Anybody here don't have a Bible app on their phone? Okay, good. There is no excuse for us as believers to not have God's word in us all day long. Am I right? Am I right? We're driving in the car. Turn Taylor Swift off. Her, her music might be really good, but it's not going to help you get to heaven. And it's not going to help you drag other people with you. Now, if you want to listen to her, that's fine. Whatever. whatever. Put, go buy this. Remember what CDs look like? You still got a CD? I still have a cassette player in my car. I don't have any cassettes, but uh, buy it, buy one CD or download it to your iPod or iPhone 5, 6, 7, or 8. Hook it into your car. Listen to God's Word. Just listen to it. Sometimes when I'm painting, I like listening to, to music, but sometimes, man, I just put, I listen to the entire book of Romans. It took about an hour to listen to it. Get back in God's Word. Listen. The world's watching you. You're the book that they're reading. They're watching how, how you survive tragedy, how you survive blessing. They're seeing it. And here's the last thing. You've got to let the Holy Spirit 
change your context so the world will make sense of what you believe. Does that make sense? Did I say that right? The world has no context for when things happen. How you live your life through the power of the Holy Spirit gives them context to what they're going through. And that is when transformation begins. Amen? Would you stand this morning? <clears throat> I have no great prayer to offer. I only pray that God's word will, will, will go forth and do what it, what it meant to do. Lord, thank you this morning. God, your word is, is powerful. It, it's sharper than a two-edged sword. It, 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 che it checks the attitudes of our hearts. It, it, it knows us. And Lord, not, it doesn't just convict us. It doesn't just convince us, but Lord, it changes us. It transforms us. It cuts out the bad and puts in the good. And so, Lord, I pray this morning that, that we've heard your word, <clears throat> and I pray that it will, will be effective in our lives, and it will it help in the transformation process. And, and as we go from this place this morning, God, remind us that what we've done here today is just meet to hear, to worship and fellowship. But as we leave this place, you're sending us out into the world as missionaries to go forth. Service begins when we leave. Lord, let us have a great day in you because no matter what happens, Jesus is Lord. And I thank you for that. All God's people said, amen. God bless this morning.